Thank you. Thank you. Well, this is a conference about scale. So I thought I'd start by asking, why do we care about scale? And I think we care about scale because we have a lot of data. And we have a lot of data because we collect it. And we collect a lot of data since we think it has value. And we think it has value because of data science. We're told that we can mine this data and get some learning out of it. So I thought it'd be appropriate to say a couple words about, about machine learning or, or data science to this audience. And along the way, talk about um, a framework, a project that I bet a lot of you in the, in the audience use, Apache Spark, which I work on by day as well. And talk about how you can help, Spark can help scale up some of these key basic machine learning algorithms to deal with all this data we've got. So the use case I'm going to talk about is very familiar, content recommendations. And I like this use case because everyone's seen a recommender. Everyone's interacted with one. Its inputs and outputs are quite familiar, I'd say. And it's almost always a big data problem. We don't really ever have a recommender problem over 10 users and three items. We have a problem over hundreds of thousands of users, tens of thousands of items, if not millions. Uh, more data is almost always better for recommenders. So these are the machine learning problems that very quickly become big data problems that we need to, to scale up to. And Spark, of course, you can't swing a cat without hitting someone that's talking about Spark these days. It's everywhere, right? And I think that recommendations, uh, scaling up recommendations are uh, a, a great showcase for some of the, the, the things we can do on Spark. It takes advantage of a lot of its nice properties. And I'm going to walk through four things that Spark does to scale up recommendations and uh, talk about how that generalizes to other large scale machine learning problems. So before we get into that, let's talk about tastes, why you and I like things and not others. This is me. These are two items from my playlist I, I, I got from Google Music. Uh, one's cool, one's kind of not very cool. Daft Punk, everybody likes Daft Punk, that's a great album. The other one's the soundtrack from the 1984 West German fantasy movie, The NeverEnding Story. Not quite as cool. But uh, they seem very different, but, but they're related somehow. There's a reason one followed the other in my playlist, and there's a connection there as uh, Giorgio Moroder, the, the, the synth producer. So that's, that's kind of cool. That's redeeming. So things happen for a reason. We, we play things for, for reasons. There's underlying patterns there. And that's good because if we uh, looked at all of your music preferences and all of your playlists, it would look kind of random. There's not an obvious order to it when we look at who's playing what tracks and so on. We, when we look at your activities, that's even just an incomplete view on your taste. It's just the things we've happened to observe. For example, if we wrote this down in a, a big table listing people down the left and um, uh, uh, albums across the top, we, we wouldn't see much order. It would look like a big, very big sparse table. That's a very incomplete view on, on all of your actual tastes. But I don't think we think this is how the world works. I think we think it works a little more like this underneath, that there are um, aesthetics or, or tastes that mediate our actions. So for example, someone that likes a little bit of rock and folk might uh, like the Pogues because they're a little bit of rock and folk. So we, I think we believe that this is actually why we like things that we do. And there is some more structured underlying order to it all, which is good because we need to find that order in order to make predictions. So maybe it's more appropriate to write, um, write two tables, really, um, people by tastes and tastes by items. And then we can explain us and items as linear combinations of these tastes. This, I think, is, is a more accurate picture of reality. And the nice thing about writing this, this way is it, it uh, invites a very clear analogy to linear algebra concepts. For example, I can write that very large table at the outset as a big matrix of ones and zeros where I, I don't know or haven't observed uh, someone playing a track. And I might say that that approximately equals some product of two other large matrices that connect users to tastes and tastes to items. And that's, um, there's a, it's a very elegant and natural correspondence between this statement of linear algebra, that one matrix is roughly equal to the product of these other two, and the, the underlying reality we just discussed. Uh, this is actually saying that our uh, actions and our, our, our tastes are linear combinations of, the, of these uh, hidden tastes. So that's great, because if we have this model, if this is really what's going on underneath uh, of that a big table of, of plays, then for any missing piece of data in that original input, we can go get the answer from this product. 
So this gives us the complete map. It gives us all the answers to who likes what and how much if we care to multiply it out. The other good answer is because we've bothered to translate this to a linear algebra problem, there are well-known solutions. So we have an algorithm, for example, called alternating least squares to give us this factorization, to take a matrix and break it down into two matrices appropriately in this way. Now, the only problem is those uh, techniques are pretty well understood at relatively small scale on one machine, and we, of course, need to scale this up to uh, distributed computing architectures and, and potentially trillions of inputs. So it's going to take a little bit of work to do that. And that's where a framework like Spark comes in. And again, I imagine most people in the room are familiar with Spark, at least in passing. Maybe you've seen it, maybe you've tried it. As a brief introduction or recap, Spark is, in two words, distributed Scala. Its fundamental abstraction is the distributed, uh, sorry, the resilient distributed data set. It's really a, an immutable distributed collection of things. And it lets you express functional transformations of those data sets, map, filter, group by, join, and so on. Now, that's nice because that lets you very nicely build up a, a graph of operations that can then be optimized, like in a, like in a SQL planner. So this is one of the reasons people say Spark is fast. Another nice thing about Spark is that because we're generally dealing with immutable data, it's easily cached. So we can put data into memory and spend memory, which is cheap, to avoid a bunch of I.O., and that's generally a win, and Spark makes that easy. The final nice thing here is we get some free fault tolerance. If these operations are deterministic, and they usually are, then if we are missing some piece of data downstream, we can always go back and recompute it from its inputs upstream. All that's wrapped up in a fairly nice API. Um, this is the obligatory word count program, if you haven't seen it in Spark. If it looks like Scala, it's because it, it is Scala, and it mimics the Scala API quite consistently. That's all you've got to do to, to count words in um, billions of, uh, billions of uh, uh, lines of text, if you'd wish to. So there's a lot of power going on underneath a fairly simple API that you could even be typing into an interactive shell here. And I think that's why people like Spark. So because we've got a lot of power in a fairly small surface area, we can write more complicated user uh, app space algorithms and take advantage of uh, and optimize further in user space rather than implement a lot of optimizations at the, at the lower levels. So Spark is nice. But it, there's four things I want to call out that help Spark speed up building a, uh, a large-scale recommender model. Number one has to do with speeding up iterative algorithms by using memory. Now, if you've worked with machine learning, you'll probably realize that a lot of uh, processes in machine learning are iterative. They're running some process over and over on a data set to refine an answer. And ALS is no exception. So we're really trying to solve this problem. Given A, we want to find uh, other matrices X and Y, such that their product is roughly equal to A and, and pretty close to A. And the problem is there's no direct way to do that. There's no one formula that would give us X and Y given A. However, if we knew Y, we could compute X as a function of A straight away. That much is actually quite easy. And likewise, if we had x, we could compute y given a as well. That's a similar, uh, simple least squares problem to solve. So fake it till you make it. Uh, what we typically start by making up a random solution for y, and given y and a computing x, and then alternating to compute y from x, and x from y, and so on and so on. And eventually, this process does converge on a pretty good solution for x and y. So that's where the alternating and the least squares comes from in this name. And the one constant throughout every iteration here is the input, the, the user ratings, the user interactions, A. Every time we run this, this big distributed operation, we need access to all of this data. So it would be nice if that were kept in memory. And in fact, it's a one line of code to ask Spark to pin that data set in memory across the cluster, to compute it and hold it available for each of these computations. Because it's easy to do, it's easy to add this to an implementation like ALS and get all the speed ups you would imagine. And this indeed is a, uh, a key to speed in a lot of iterative algorithms, making sure you cache that, that reusable data every time. Spark makes that easy. Number two, rearrange math advantageously. I think we've all seen contexts where two mathematically equivalent expressions uh, have wildly different properties when implemented in code. Sometimes uh, one version of an equation would be faster or more numerically stable than others. And that is definitely true. Uh, at, at scale. So this is one of the key equations that needs to be solved when uh, uh, doing the ALS factorization. 
it looks a little more intimidating than it is, but I've color-coded some, some problem areas. So this is the formula as given in the paper uh, to compute one row of x from y. And the big problem here is that every row of x is a different function of all of y. Uh, y is this large distributed dense matrix. Uh, Cu is a dense diagonal matrix. So this says we would have to do compute a, a Gramian almost for every single row of x. And that's just way too much work. We've also got another problem in here. That's the, there's an inverse. Uh, we don't generally ever want to compute a matrix inverse if we can avoid it because they're numerically unstable and it takes some time. Um, and yeah, those, those jump out as, as problems. So sure enough, uh, one of the key insights in, in the paper is that you can rearrange this a little bit to be much, much friendlier to the computation. For example, we can move that matrix inverse over where it belongs on the left side and really just solve a system of equations here instead, which doesn't require, strictly speaking, a full inverse. You can break up that scary term in the middle to be two terms, one of which does not depend on the row, the y transpose y Gramian, so that could be pre-computed. And uh, the cleverly, the remaining bit becomes sparse. It's a, it still requires a function of this big matrix Y, but only a sparse, uh, we only need a, a couple rows of it to compute this per row. So that's a lot more tractable. With a little bit of re rearrangement, this goes from infeasible to pretty, pretty feasible. Now the only remaining problem here, I think, is that actually every row requires some rows of Y. So if we're computing a block of rows of x, we're going to need most or potentially all of y. And that's a lot of data to, to, put, uh, to, to join together with every, every um, row to compute x. So we probably need to think a little harder about how we do the join. So what I mean is, conceptually, when we, when we uh, compute uh, x, we're actually computing blocks of rows of x at once, and for every block of rows of x, we're going to need potentially all of the rows uh, of y. And that means basically a full Cartesian join between a and y. And that sounds bad. And it is bad. We really don't want to shuffle all of y to all the worker nodes in the, in the cluster. But actually, if we look at the input matrix a, wherever a block of rows doesn't actually touch a column of y, we don't need that column. And actually, this matrix is quite sparse. So that's true most of the time. And in fact, if we look at these blocks and, and, and look at blocks where we have all zeros, where there's no input whatsoever, we can avoid joining that block of A to that block of Y entirely. And that's generally true of most of this input matrix. So doing this intelligently, doing this join specially, makes a world of difference. In fact, it's possible to rearrange, to some degree, the rows of X to optimize this, uh, the, the, the sparsity and get better blocking. So this is some stuff you'll find Spark does under the hood to make this key stage, which would otherwise be quite painful and quite slow on the cluster, to go quite fast. Last but not least, using native math. So a lot of the work in this algorithm and a lot of machine learning algorithms is just a bunch of number crunching. And number crunching is not new. Uh, people have been doing linear algebra for decades on computers and have, and have even written optimized libraries for it, like BLAS. BLAS is uh, basic linear algebra subprograms. You can find this installed on your, on, your Linux, um, uh, on your Linux systems. So we want to be able to leverage that, since a lot of the work is distributed, yes, but locally we're doing lots of local linear algebra in memory, and we want to accelerate that as much as possible rather than staying within the JVM and doing it strictly in, in the JVM. So fortunately, that is quite possible and done in Spark. Uh, what BLAST does is give you functions that can compute common patterns of linear algebra. So let's say you wanted to compute a, a matrix times a vector plus another vector and multiply them all by some scalars. There's a function that can do that for you. Given the arrays of floating point numbers, you can push it down to BLAST and it will give you the answer in place. Now, that fortunately is quite easy to access from the JVM, from Spark, through libraries like Netlib. So Netlib uses JNI to push down some of these core linear algebra operations into native code that's been highly optimized for the chip and for the hardware. Uh, for the only downside, I think, to BLAST is its methods are really cryptically named. So this method is called DGMV. Don't know why. It has reasons that each of the letters means something, but uh, fortunately, this is done under the hood already by Spark for some of those key operations. But it's something any user land program can do to, to get some speed up from native hardware. 
In fact, you could do very similar things to push some of these big computations down to GPUs if they were available. So, so in closing, think of four things that sparked us to scale up recommendations that actually could be applicable to lots of machine learning algorithms, including the applications you're building. One, use memory when you can use memory. Memory is cheap, memory is plentiful. It's much better to go access memory than go to local disk or certainly go grab data across the network. Number two, certainly in mathematically intense operations, think about the structure of your operations. Optimize for sparsity. Rearrange operations to, to uh, use simpler operations instead of uh, more, uh, more complicated ones where possible. Shuffles and joins are always painful. Always look for ways to optimize them. Look for ways to avoid them. Or if you can't avoid them, do them more intelligently to avoid a lot of the overhead. Shuffles are almost always where jobs die and where they run out of resource. Finally, certainly if you're doing a bunch of math and increasingly uh, with the rise of things like deep learning, a lot more of these machine learning algorithms are just raw math. Do use native acceleration. Use that, the, the strength of that hardware and decades of research and optimizing those operations, even when calling from a, a very tall stack like, uh, like Spark. Thank you very much.